so I am the, uh, the high school pastor here. I'm one of the youth pastors, and I am so excited today. I'm going to be talking to us about... I'm going to be concluding our series. We've been doing a five-week series on five things that will help grow your faith. And I, I love it. I, I do a lot of things in this church, but finishing up series, like, that's tops. I just love that. So we're going to, we're going to be talking about something to help grow your faith. And it's been really fun for me because it's been a chance for me to sort of rediscover and remember the things that have helped grow my faith in the past. And so I've been thinking through, like last week we talked about our circumstances and what circumstances help grow your faith. And I thought, oh man, God helped these specific things. And so I've been sort of thinking about like who I am as a person and this process of self-discovery. Uh, I'm, I have a 15 month old daughter. And so as a dad, I'm always discovering new things because she keeps growing new teeth, which means I keep losing like a night of sleep, which means I like learn that I have more character than I ever thought I did. <laughs> and so, so it's, uh, it's, it's, I've been learning a lot. And one of the things that I've been doing the last maybe maybe year or so, is I ride my bicycle basically everywhere. That's how I get from place to place. And I didn't know this about the bicycling culture. I'm going to refer to it as biking from now on because like, I'm not cool enough to ride a motorcycle. Like Our worship pastor rides a mo motorcycle. TJ does. Um, I'm not that cool. But when I talk about bike, that's, I'm talking about bicyclists. So in biking culture, there are a lot of different sorts of bikers, and I ride the Sammamish Valley Trail all the time, and I see the whole gambit. Like, there's the, like, daily commuter who, like, has their, their they just dress a certain way, and then there's the, the like, laid-back guy who's just out for a day on the trail, and, like, they'll go a certain way, and then there's the, like, ultimate gonna be in the Tour de France type guy who's, like, super intense. It was last week I was riding home from work and I saw this guy and he was he was there's no nice way to say this he was old uh, not that there's anything wrong with being old but it's not nice to call people old this guy there's nothing else I could do other than say that and he was riding so fast and so hard and he had like this like speed suit on and this fast bike and he was just going for it and this thing that bikers do when you're when you're going the other way you try and like make eye contact with the other guy so that you can like have a moment it's like have your souls connect like <laughs> You, like, yeah, I know you. You're also a super intense Tour de France biker like me. So he tried to have that soul-connecting moment with me, and I wish that my face was able to, to do what he did and you could all see it. But basically, when he was trying to have this intimate bicycling moment with me as we crossed paths, he went... <laughs> like that, and tried to stare deeply into my soul. And I realized, I am not Ultimate Tour de France biker guy. <laughs> I, and, and so uh, I, I, I've been trying to think, what kind of biker guy am I? And basically, it's just the confused kind. <laughs> Because, like, I have, I have this commuter bicycle, which is awesome, and it's great. But I also wear, like, I commute year-round. And when you commute year-round, there's rain, which means you have to wear all the spandex. So I do that. I'm sorry to everyone. Now you're just going to be imagining Ben in spandex the rest of the sermon. Yeah. Uh, and so I ride the commuter bicycle, but I dress like I'm, like, ultimate super rider. Just confusing. And that is... Uh, that's, that's true of a lot of us about how we think of ourselves. Try and say, who am I? And we're very, very confused. Uh, one of the things that confused me recently about being a full-time staff member at Washington Cathedral is I learned that not everyone thinks exactly the same way as me all the time. It's surprising. I didn't know. I just thought, I, well, for one thing, I thought that all of my thoughts were perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out I've got a lot to learn and a lot of great people teaching me. But one of the things that I do uh, is I like to understand a thing fully. Like if we're going to go and we're going to do a project or put on an event, I like to understand every aspect of it. And so I always want to like say like, all right, everyone, let's like step back one more step and let's analyze this a bit more. Uh, and it'll be like, okay, we need to like add a worship song or something like that. And I'll be like, okay, let's step back and analyze why I do that. And then we have a great conversation about why we do worship and what it means and we're all encouraged. 
Sometimes this uh, is not helpful. So someone will be like, hey, we should go to teriyaki for lunch. And I'll be like, all right, we just need to step back and analyze. Why teriyaki? What does that mean to you? Why not a burrito? And people will be like, it's teriyaki. Let's just go get lunch. Sometimes that why question is not helpful. It's a part of how I think, though. And for this series, I think it's a really helpful thing for us to think about. To ask the why question. Because we've been talking about how to grow your faith. And as we're concluding, I just thought it'd be good for us to take a minute to sort of wrap up and say, why? Why grow your faith? Now, to a lot of us, that might be like a no-brainer, duh, Ben, I'm in church, uh, sort of question. But I think it's really valuable for us to ask, why is it that we want to grow our faith? And the reason why is because when we say, I want to grow my faith, a lot of times we mean a wide variety of things. So sometimes what we mean is we uh, have a circumstance in our life that we're facing that's really hard, and we want an answer to that problem. And we say, okay, I just need more faith to get through this. Uh, we have sometimes, uh, maybe we look at our society and we look around us and we see people who are just doing things that are wrong, that don't line up with our sense of morals, that don't line up with the way that we think the world should work. And so we say, I want to grow my faith so I can clarify my morals to the people around me. And so a lot of times we say, I want to grow my faith, and we mean various different things. What we're saying is we mean I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to handle this situation, and I need more faith in God. Or sometimes we say, uh, the world is wrong, and faith is what's going to be the solution to it. Really, a lot of times we look at faith as a solution to a problem. And I want to tell you that that's a very common way to think of it. That's what a lot of us do, but it is totally and completely wrong. Faith is not a solution to a problem. And that might sound shocking to you. I, some people are looking at me like, well, what other options are there, Pastor Ben? <laughs> I'm going to tell you. But I want to I wanna do some, some background on this to start out because that is sort of a confusing statement to say faith isn't a solution to a problem because all of us have said, I, I mean, I, as a student, when I did grad school, it was like, I'm not going to pass this test. I just need more faith. I'm going to get through it. Uh, we've, we've been there. But let me describe it this way. I am a father of a, a beautiful young girl, and it's not like every morning I wake up and I take out, and like when she gets up and she comes out, I take out a tape measurer and I measure her and say, all right, in the last two months she's grown half an inch, that is adequate, I am a father. That's not the way I do it. People don't like ask like, hey, what are you enjoying about being a dad right now? And I'm not like, well, what it means to be a father is that my daughter has seven teeth now and so we're doing a good job. That's not the way it works. When someone asks what does it mean to be a father, like the thing that I think of is when she wakes up from her nap and she's got wild hair that's all over the place and she sort of scampers up and she goes, dada! And then she bites me with those seven teeth. And... <laughs> And it's just, she doesn't actually bite that much anymore. So if your kids are in the nursery, no worries. I d I'm not raising a biter, hopefully. Unless your kid deserves it, then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but being a father is more than just the size of my child. So often we look at faith and we say, it's, I just need more of it. I need to grow it. We, we think of it like money, and if things go bad, I've, I've done enough good things and believed the right things that I've, I've amassed this huge stockpile of faith, and when a bad time comes, I'm going to have enough surplus faith to ride out the storm. That's not what faith is. That's not the way faith works. And the, the thing about it, though, is that faith is sort of difficult for us to understand. And the reason why is not something that we all need to really beat ourselves up over, but I do want to help clarify some things for us. And it's that the way the Bible talks about faith is a concept that's hard for us in our language and culture to really translate into very easily. 
it's not easy for us to understand the biblical concept of faith. So I'm going to say something that's going to blow your guys' minds. The Bible da -da 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 -da, was not written in English. Dun, dun, dun! English actually wasn't even invented by the time the Bible was being written. It wasn't even a thing yet. And so, when we look at the Bible, the, the New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament is written in uh, Hebrew, Jesus probably t spoke in Aramaic, which is neither of those languages, and so there's a lot of translation that happens. And so when we talk about faith, we're doing some translation. And Almost all, our Bibles are all great. Their translations are great. They do different things. But the concept of faith is one that's just hard to translate. And this is what I mean. When the Bible talks about faith, and I need to give a caveat, I am a nerd. <laughs> There's, there's no way around that. When I was in grad school, I taught uh, as an English professor just because I like grammar and language, and uh, it was fun for me. I taught it in prison, uh, not as a prisoner, but as a professor. And so, so that gives me some street cred, but I still was a grammar nerd. Uh, and and so, so that's my caveat. I also minored in Greek, and so caveat number two. This is going to get nerdy, but I think it's going to be fun. The, for me. <laughs> when we talk about faith, so often we talk about as a noun, an object, a thing that we can get. You say, I want to have more faith. And a, a great example of that is your beliefs. Someone will say, what is your faith? You say, I'm a Christian. Well, what do you believe? I believe these 10 statements of faith, or these three statements of faith, or if you're really serious, these 500 statements of faith. We have these statements of faith. And so, what is your faith? It's that thing. Maybe an abstract concept, but it's a thing. When the Bible talks about faith, it talks about it as an action or as something that's called a participle, which is an, a describing word action. So like uh, if someone were to say, hey, who's that guy? And they'd be like, he's the running man. You know, running, man. Running would be like a verb used to describe the man. He's the running man. You, you guys know the running man, right? It's a dance. I just, let's see it. All right, why don't you stand up and do the running man? I embarrassed myself enough for you guys. No, we're, we're fine. <laughs> we're good. That's how the Bible talks about faith. Not well, as a dance, that's very poetic. But the Bible talks about faith as this action. It's an ongoing thing. When we talk about faith, that's, we don't really have a word for that. It'd be like saying, what kind of man is he? Or what kind of woman is she? She's a faithing woman. Right? We don't say that. We have other words that do that. You can say trust. You can say belief. There are other words. But when we talk specifically about faith... We don't really have a good concept for that. And uh, there's, there's this passage that I really love that helps describe this. And it's in John chapter 7. And it's actually not in your handout, but it's very close to a verse that is. So you can handle it. So can I. And it's in it's verse 38. And what it says is, Whoever believes in me... Uh, let's actually do the one that is in your handout. Let's go to John chapter 7, verse 17. It says, If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God. Jesus is speaking this passage in a time where there's a big festival, there's a ton of people around, and they're wanting to know who he is. They're saying, Who is this guy? What's he all about? And Jesus responds by saying, If you want to know who I am, Try out what I'm doing, and you'll find out whether it's true or false. It's a really cool passage. And after that, he goes on to say something else. And it's in verse 38. He says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Now, in this passage, in the Greek, it's using a participle. It's saying, the believing one. The one who is believing. The believing person, whoever that is, that person will have streams of living water come up from within them. And so it's talking about faith as this ongoing process, as this relational thing. 
And when you look at the other verse, the first one I read, John 7, it says if any, or John 7, 17, if anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching is from God. So often we look at faith as a solution to a problem. We look at it as this thing that like, I need, I, I've got a problem and I just need more faith and that's going to fix things. These passages show that that's not the case whatsoever. What Jesus says is, he doesn't say, anyone who believes what I say will then have faith. It says, whoever is believing is going to, their faith will grow. What he says is, if you choose to do God's will, you'll find out what God has for you. And so, this is something that uh, I can sort of explain a little bit more in this way. Faith isn't a solution to a problem. Faith is a miracle. That's something that so few of us are willing to, to realize. You look at faith and you think, okay, the way I'm going to grow my faith is, is doing these things, these like solid concepts or believing these things or going to the right place or listening to the right preacher or having some thing that I do and that's what's going to grow my faith. But so rarely do we realize that faith is a miracle. And it's, it's sort of like what I explained with my daughter. It's not like... Uh, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me explain it in a different way. I am a youth pastor. Uh, I've been one for a long time. And I, uh, I'm not old, but I've been doing this here long enough that I feel old, which is a weird place to be in. That's a moment of self-discovery for you, where you start recognizing that like, there are kids who I had when they were like little kids in my class, and now they're like grown up and in college and doing things like big things. And that's like, whoa, I'm growing up. There are kids who I remember when they were just trouble. Like everyone who talked to them, everyone who knew them, they were just a pain in the neck. And then over time they start to grow. And it's so cool for me because when I watch them, I get to see this little miracle happen. It's this little thing where kids will be hanging out, they'll be doing their stuff, and then they'll come and they'll ask, hey, Ben, what does faith have to say about this situation in my life? And I'm like, wow, that's an amazing question. There's a little grain of something, a little ignition of something that happens, and it feels like a miracle. In John chapter 4, uh, it's verse 14. Jesus is talking to a woman and it's this woman who's an outcast. Everyone in society has nothing to do with, there's no reason Jesus would have anything to do with her. Everyone else has ignored her. And Jesus goes to talk to her, and they get into this deep theological debate. They get into this deep, like, heavy-hitting, hard, like, heavyweight theological battle where she's like, hey, tell me about why you worship where you worship. And Jesus is like, we do it because of this. And then and she'll say, like, well, what about your disciples about this? And what about this about Scripture? And they, they get in this fight, well, not fight, but this debate. And Jesus gets to a point where he says, listen, whoever comes to me, I will give this water. And with that water, they will never thirst again. And that passage sounds really nice, but one thing that a lot of us don't realize is that that passage relates to a much older biblical motif. And it's a motif of the spring of living water. And so I want to take you guys to Isaiah 41. This is a really beautiful passage that will help us understand a little bit about the miracle of faith. And this is what it says. It says, The poor and the needy are in search of water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but the Lord will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on the barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I'll put in the desert the cedar, the acadia, the myrtle, and the olive tree. I'll set pines in the wasteland and fir and cypress together so that the people may see and know and may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. So Jesus is in this debate with this woman, and he says, 
I'll make a spring come up. And automatically it's got to be like, ding, 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 ding. And I, something goes off in her head where she recognizes, oh, he's referencing this old thing. He's saying that he's going to be the source of this spring of water. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. In another passage where Jesus references this, going back into the, to, to the Greek that I was referencing before, it says that that stream of living water will come out of your kolia. Now, kolia might sound somewhat familiar to some of us because it's the root of the word colon, like your colon. Um, and for us, that is a little bit gross. That is the facts. For them back in their day, it meant your deepest inner self. And so when Jesus is saying this spring will come, he's saying it will well up from your deepest inner self, the wellspring of who you are, your deepest identity. You'll start to have this spring form in you. And there was another word that they could have used. There were multiple words for this, like, guts, intestines sort of area. And one of them was one of the best words. All Greek students learn it and they love it. Uh, it's splunkna. They didn't actually pronounce it that way, I'm sure. But that's how, how it's pronounced. Splunkna. And it's funny because this word is sort of an onomatopoeia. Because if you were in the battlefield and you got stabbed in the gut, it would splunkna. It was like, that's what it meant. It was your grit, your guts, your strength, your power. You're that like part of you that you leave it all out there when you work your hardest. It's your, your that like es essential part. And so it could have said, out of your splunkna will come a stream of living water. Out of your effort, out of your strength, out of your power will come a stream of living water. But it doesn't say that. It says, out of your kolia, which I shouldn't, it's kind of gross. But what it means is out of this essential, core, deep wellspring of who you are. So we think about faith. We think about how to grow our faith, and we think of it as this thing that maybe we can get, but that's not how Jesus describes it. He describes it as a miracle, as a deep and old and ancient miracle, where when people become aware of what God's done, there are streams in the desert. There's water that flows on the barren heights. There are plants that come up, and, and it's a miracle. And me as a youth pastor, that's what I get to see. That kid who comes to me and says, how does faith apply in my life? I see that is a trickle of a stream. That's a little bit of faith, a little bit of a miracle. And sometimes I'll go to a camp and the kids will have an amazing time and the stream becomes this creek that's like overflowing and breaking down the barriers. So they go to school and they just like tell everyone like, Jesus is cool. And their friends are like, you're crazy. And they're like, oh, I'm depressed. And the stream goes back down. And then sometimes I see that in adults too where the stream changes. But regardless, it's always a miracle. It's always a miracle. And what's amazing for me is I get to see kids who started out as trouble and now they are becoming a source of life for other people. You look in the passage, the Isaiah passage, it says that all the nations will come and receive the stream, receive the water of faith, the water of the Spirit. And so I get to watch students who used to be trouble now becoming all kinds of things, getting jobs, becoming youth leaders, becoming youth pastors. And they start to have this faith in them that starts to bubble up and come out and show. And other kids start to see it and they start to have that little miracle of faith happen in them too. Faith is a miracle. But if you just view it as a solution to a problem, you're missing out on so, so very much. The thing about it, though, is that when I talk about faith as a miracle, a lot of you know that you've waited for miracles that don't happen. And a lot of times when we say it's a miracle, it means there's nothing that I have to do with it. We're familiar with this. We live in a world that's very broken. This weekend, we're celebrating Memorial Day. Jesus Christ came so that we would never have to celebrate another Memorial Day again. 
He came to wipe out all war. He came to bring peace and reconciliation. Uh, he came to bring light and resurrection from the dead. But we know we live in a world where it's not so easy, where we mourn. We're so grateful for all of the sacrifices that people do, and we're always working towards a more perfect union as our country and a place where people can live in faith and follow God as they please. But we recognize that it's always a battle and we're always working towards it. That's the world we live in, one where we're waiting for some miracles still to happen. But the miracle of faith isn't necessarily one of those kinds of miracles. It's a miracle that you get to take part in. It's a miracle that you participate in. But it's not the way that you might think. Participating in the miracle of faith doesn't mean that I took the right class and attended the right Bible study and learned the right precepts so that I can check them off on a list and someone says, what's your faith? And I can say, here it is, and show them my certificate of completion. That's not what faith is. Faith is a relationship. Remember how we talked about how Jesus described faith? He described it as anyone who chooses to do God's will we'll find out whether their faith is true. We'll find out whether what I preach is true. It's an action. It's a relationship. It's faithing. And so there are a lot of ways for us to grow our faith. Not as like this thing that we get, but as a way that we connect with God. And this is what I mean. When I think of people who I've seen grow in their faith, it's not from necessarily the classes they take, though that's essential. The things that help them grow their faith are when I see someone who chooses to be joyful. When life is hard or life is good, when the people around them are negative and they just have a joy. And you say, where does that come from? It's this wellspring from deep inside of them. Or when I see someone who has done something that is totally wrong, and they, they know that it's not what God wants, and they've been someone who is not who God wants them to be. They're on a life track and a trajectory that's going to destroy them, and they repent. They choose to go God's way instead of their own way. And faith starts to bubble up. Their faith grows. I see all the time, just this last weekend, we had a bunch of kids get together and hang out, and I've seen it so many times, and you get a group of middle school boys together, and they mess around, and they joke around, and they wrestle, and they uh, sometimes get in arguments, but they also they just, just hang out together in a context where Jesus Christ is expected to be right there in the middle of them, and over time, you start to see faith start to bubble up in their conversations and in their lives. And you don't look at that and say, all right, how did that kid grow his faith? His faith is now seven units where it was five. Though even that can be a helpful way to think of faith sometimes. You don't say, what made their faith grow? You say, wow, what a miracle that that happened. And it's from those little things that they do, those little participatory things where they become aware of God's presence in their life. There is one way, though, to fast-track your faith growth, which sounds like the worst self-help book ever, <laughs> how to fast-track your faith growth. It's like completely contrary to what I'm talking about, so I need to explain that a little bit. The way that your faith grows is the miracle of getting to know Jesus Christ. It's to have Jesus look you in the eyes and say, I love you, I care for you, I know you, and I have a plan for you. That is the miracle of faith. The way to see God, one of the best ways to do it is to put yourself where God is acting. And so for me, when I think of where is God acting, it's working with youth. It's one of the ways that I see God. Basically, the way to fast track your faith is to use your gift, whatever that is. And so for me, I work with youth, and I think of what is God doing, and all the time I imagine like God is up there, like shooting his Holy Spirit bullets at places, and like touching kids' lives, and doing things, and, and so I want to be someone who puts myself right in the line of fire, so that right as like when God is touching someone's life, I'm like, there it is, and when God does it again, there it is, there it is, there he is, there's God. 
And so I work with kids because this window from maybe 8 years old to 16, that's when kids are most likely to accept faith. They start to reject some other things in their life and they start to associate more with their friends and they start to question the world. And a lot of them find that Jesus Christ is the answer. So for me, I use my gift. I work with the kids. And when I do, I see these miracles happen. Bam! A kid starts to accept God just a little bit. A kid sees the way God cares about them. A leader sees that God used them and that that was a miracle. And I see faith just start to gurgle up all around me. And it is a beautiful landscape to be in. And it grows my faith. The best way for you to grow your faith is to use your gift. But there's an important distinction to make. You're not growing your faith by doing the right thing. You're growing your faith by seeing Jesus Christ acting. You're growing your faith because God is moving and you can't help but say, there are miracles all around me. And maybe they're not the big, flashy miracles that you've heard about because those still happen, but they're not, hap they're not as, I don't know how to say it, they happen. But the better miracles are the ones that transform our lives. And when you use your gift, you see lives transformed. And so one of the best ways to fast track your faith, growth, is to see Jesus Christ. The best way to see Jesus Christ is to use your gift. But I also have to warn you, there is a way to kill your faith like that. And that is, when you start to see faith as something that you control. When you see faith as, I'm going to go to church 17 times a week. Or, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read 75 pages of the Bible every day. And it becomes this action of, like, I'm going to do enough things that I'm going to grow a lot of faith. Or, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the right Bible study, read the right lesson. And it, we start to see it as, as that sort of thing. To believe that you are in control of faith is going to kill it like that. Because faith is what happens when we see Jesus. And to believe that you get to control Jesus is to objectify Jesus. It's to pretend like there's no relationship that can happen. It's to pretend like you are God, in a way. To say that I know what's going to grow my faith. And so one of the best ways to kill your faith is to believe that you're the one who's in charge of it. There's such a better way to go. And that is to recognize that faith comes when I see Jesus Christ. I started out by saying, by asking the question, why grow your faith? And I think I've made it clear a lot of times we want to grow our faith because of our own insecurity. Or we want to grow our faith to fix other people. And that's so off. Because that's not what Jesus asks us to do. He didn't go and talk to that woman so that she would become some superpower saint. He did it because he loved her. I'm not a parent because I want my daughter to someday get tall. Good luck with that. Yeah, me and Becca are both short. <laughs> me being a parent means I just love my child. And the thing about it is, when I see students or adults or anybody, they start to do this thing where they see a little bit of Jesus and there's just a little bit of a trickle that happens. And then over time, they get closer and closer and that trickle becomes a stream. And that stream starts to pour out into other people's lives. And I've seen it. I'm seeing it now. Where people who used to be students in ministry or in youth ministry are now leaders in youth ministry and they're starting to see the miracles around them. They're starting to see that their faith is pouring over into other people's lives. They're starting to see all of that. And you ask them, hey, 
or you tell them, hey, that's great, your faith has really grown, they're not going to stand up and say, well, let me tell you, I've done a lot of great things. They're going to say, God is so good. I've seen God working in people's lives. Why do you want your faith to grow? That's kind of the wrong question. Because the whole point is, I want to get closer to Jesus Christ. And as you do it, your faith is going to grow. And here is the kicker. Our faith is not supposed to grow just for us. God wants our faith to grow on behalf of everyone around us. Because the stream that wells up from deep inside of you is a stream of eternal life. And it's one that all the nations are meant to come and to see. And this is something that God wants for each one of us. For you to become the stream of living water for every person that you come in contact with in your week. He wants you to become so enlivened with faith that when things are hard, you're not saying, oh, I gotta get a better surplus of faith. You're saying, the God that I know is so good. You're saying, I saw a miracle yesterday because somebody I know recognized faith in a way that was different. You become the source of life. And when someone comes to you and they say, wow, you have such a great faith. When times are hard and a family member says, I need help, you have faith. You don't stand up and say, yeah, I'm really great. You're able to say, God is so, so very, very good. And it's a miracle that happens. So that's my prayer for each one of us. That instead of just desiring faith for faith's sake, we would want to get closer to Jesus. And that we would start to participate in the miracle that God is already doing in every one of your lives. The miracle where you start to see, I'm a child of the living God, of a resurrected Savior, of Jesus Christ, and it's a wellspring of life in me. Maybe some of us have never felt like you've had that stream. This is a time. Awaken it. Start to do the things that God wants. Take, make the choice to follow Jesus Christ, and you'll start to see it. Some of you maybe have lost the stream a long time ago. It's got choked out by the, the distractions in the world. Recognize that the way to get it back is to fall in love with Jesus again. And there are things you can do to fall in love with Jesus again. And that it's a miracle and God's faithful to come through for you. Stand with me for the closing benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you and to make you strong, to do far more than you could ever ask or imagine. God, my prayer is that you would awaken us to your life and your love so that we can have faith. My prayer is that in each one of our lives, that little trickle would become a, a roaring river, that it would flow out into the lives around us, into the people who need you, and that it would flow, and we would become a church that is so full of your spirit that it would be like a river that fills up this valley so that when people come, they'd see that this is a place where I can find Jesus. This is a place where my life can be transformed. I ask that in the desert places in our lives, in the desert places of our souls, schools, of our school system, of our, of our community, that you would start to bring up trees and rivers and streams of your spirit as we become people who are so deeply touched and in love with you that it changes everything around us. Grow our faith, but not in terms of the things we do, but in terms of the way we seek you. Because in seeking you, the world is going to see you. Help us to become the people you want us to be. We pray this all in Jesus' name.